And welcome to our exclusive interview with Bill Gates, the entrepreneur, Microsoft co-founder, software developer, and philanthropist. Thanks for being here. Great to talk to you. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's annual letter has now just come out. Uh, you both write about how this pandemic, in your view, will be as defining as World War II. What are the key steps to take right now? Uh, well, we have to do two things at once. We have to bring this epidemic to, the, to an end, uh, primarily by getting the vaccine out in large numbers to the entire world. And we have to make sure that we're ready uh, because there will be another pandemic. And there's so many lessons about uh, how we weren't prepared, how we should have handled things differently. And you know, when that's clearly in our mind, uh, those investments need to be made. You mentioned being ready for the next time. And you warned about this last time. Let's take a brief look at a 2015 warning you issued. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. If we start now, we can be ready for the next epidemic. How ready was the world for this, uh, say, on a scale of 1 to 10? And how about the U.S.? Um, the U.S. gets a, a low score because the understanding of how to get uh, diagnostics up to scale early uh, to stop the exponential spread, you know, if that had been done well, we would have been more like an Australia or a South Korea uh, where the death toll is less than a tenth of the tragic situation in the United States. So uh, we made mistakes before the epidemic in not investing more. And then during the epidemic, we also made mistakes. Um, there's one category we did well, which was uh, getting R&D money out to the vaccine companies. Uh, the U.S. was the biggest at that. Uh, and so at least, you know, in that one area, uh, uh, where we've set a model for the world. You're very specific in your work and the letter about what should come next. You talk about a global alert system, infectious disease first responders, and germ games. Walk us through what some of that looks like uh, and whether you think international organizations and the Biden administration can do more on that now. Well, the great thing is that the tens of billions required for all that preparedness it's the insurance policy that avoids you losing tens of trillions like we are uh, globally right now. And so it's, it's quite a bargain, even if you only look at what it can do uh, to help during a pandemic. But those investments can also help us improve health on a much broader basis. Uh, so the mRNA vaccine can be used for TB and HIV. Uh, you know, we're very excited about that, and uh, we've been funding mRNA for over 10 years, and now it's you know, accelerated its development. And getting those early warning systems in, uh, that'll improve health all over the world. So uh, this time, I think people will pay attention. Hmm. Your letter also goes really through a whole bunch of influences, from the movie Contagion to Winston Churchill to you and your wife's interest in confronting systemic racism. Uh, and structural racism. And you write that pandemics, quote, exploit pre-existing inequalities. Uh, and you're working and doing funding with historically black colleges on testing. Walk us through what does this mean? Why does it happen this way? Does it have to be this way? And how do you fix it? Well, it's pretty stunning that the infection rate and death rate in minorities has been over twice as high. And that really wouldn't have been expected. Uh, in fact, we need to understand it a lot better. You know, it's partly multi-generational households. Uh, it's partly job occupation. Uh, you know, it may have been uh, the ability to commute, communicate health messages in uh, to those households. I, you know, I'm, I'm stunned at that. Uh, sadly, I'm not stunned uh, with the idea that the inner city schools uh, were the least prepared with internet connections and training in order to do online education. And so the gap between the suburban schools and the inner city schools, which was already very large and a uh, you know, terrible inequity, uh, it's been more dramatic in this last year uh, than, than ever. 
And so we've got to reinvest in those schools, uh, taking some of the good things we've learned about how we can use online tools, uh, but helping those kids catch up. You know, Mr. Gates, trying to warn about pandemics and then protect people's lives during them doesn't sound that controversial. Uh, but as you know, and I think some of our viewers know, uh, you have a lot of critics, uh, including, uh, for example, here's a Fox News host um, who was attacking you for advocating contact tracing uh, in April. Take a look. There's a new threat to our rights on the horizon, and it's being pushed by the second wealthiest man in the world. According to Gates, the only way to responsibly end the shutdowns is is for a pretty vast surveillance system to be put in place, arguing that it will be unsafe to work or to travel or go to church or a ball game unless we give up our personal data. Well, I haven't seen the scientific proof for any of that. Is that a fair assessment of what you're trying to do, and what's your response? Well, contact tracing uh, was incredibly beneficial in places like South Korea. And, you know, we'd have hundreds of thousands of people alive today in the U.S. if we had done that. Uh, the data, you don't actually have to give up your personal data. That's not a fair way of describing it. Uh, you know, some societies really uh, chose to, to make that work. Sadly, because of our mistakes in diagnostics, uh, our numbers got so large that even the states that made an effort, the benefits of the contact tracing wasn't gigantic. Uh, so it's really as you get down in, you know, lower infection rates, you know, like three, four percent, then the contact tracing helps drive that down uh, even lower. When you look at that kind of disagreement or attack, do you see it as just ignorant or also malicious? Because there's a lot on the Internet, of the stuff that's not true, we're not giving airtime to, um, but that, that tries to rope you into something. Yeah, so both uh, myself and Dr. Fauci have uh, featured in conspiracy theories. You know, like one says that Dr. Fauci is trying to make money off of these vaccines and, and various negative things about me. Uh, you know, there you're encouraging people not to trust the advice on masks or uh, taking the vaccine, and that could be damaging. It's a new phenomena. I don't know. You know, will it hurt the vaccine uptake where everyone who takes the vaccine is not just protecting themselves, but reducing their transmission uh, to other people and allowing society to get back to normal? Um, you know, so we're it's a completely unexpected phenomena. And, you know, sadly, a lot of it's based on false information. Yeah, I just have one, one follow up on that, which is you're known to be both effective and an optimist. What do you say to people who look at this and, and feel like scientists, experts, and you warned and gave the public information? And by your own assessment uh, today, uh, it still didn't go very well according to the government policies in charge. And you're out here still working on it. What do you say to people who are pessimistic about either failure or incompetence and lies winning out? Well, you... Um Whenever you make mistakes, you have to learn from them. And the U.S. has so much talent, uh, so much ability to get things right, so much ability to lead the world uh, and help. You know, almost every infectious disease event of the last 100 years, the U.S. Uh, played a, a very strong role. The CDC uh, is the most respected health organization. Uh, in this one, we didn't set a good example, and we even withdrew from the WHO. So, uh, you know, it wasn't our finest hour, uh, but I remain optimistic, and I look at the new team uh, that's engaged, uh, you know, looking at the science, being willing to deliver uh, the bad news that the next few months are going to continue to be tough. And, uh, you know, I feel great that uh, we we're correcting some of the mistakes that were made. You mentioned the new team. Uh was President Biden right to rejoin the WHO, and have you spoken to him recently, or will you? Uh, I spoke to him, um, Melinda and I, soon after the election, and uh, the pandemic was definitely one of the key topics there. And uh, we're thrilled that uh, he's rejoined the WHO, because that's where you share best practices, 
Uh, that's where you, you know, make sure the numbers are there to see what's going on. For example, understanding uh, these variants uh, that are a bit scary because they are more transmissive and uh, we'll get data soon on whether the vaccines are slightly less effective or not. Um, and so, yes, uh, it's kind of a common sense move to bring the world together because it's us versus the disease. And every one of these vaccines involves scientists in many countries and the trials were done in many countries. You know, no country alone could possibly deal with this. In the letter, you discuss how so many people are struggling, so many people grieving uh, because of COVID. And, and you yourself discuss not even being able to gather in person uh, for your father uh, when he died in September. Uh, he was famously proud of you and uh, people uh, like myself from Seattle uh, know about his work and yours. And I did just want to play a little bit of him if, if you don't mind us showing this. Great. Let me introduce Bill Gates, the largest philanthropist in the history of the world. How do you feel when you're able to introduce him at something? There are no words to describe it. I, how much pride can you have? I, whatever the highest number is, that's where I am. Your reflections and what he taught you? Well, my dad uh, both, uh, you know, set a good example and uh, was always willing to tell me when I, he thought I should do better. He personally, uh, with Patty Stonecipher, helped create the foundation while I was still uh, full-time at Microsoft. And so his integrity really set the culture of that organization. Um, you know, I, my dad's example is one that I'll never match. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he made so much difference. And, uh, you know, he was always uh, cheering me on, uh, you know, loved uh, the fact he, he was involved. And, and so it's, it's sad. You know, he lived a great life. Uh, he, you know, was 94 uh, when he died. And uh, uh, so we did have to limit that getting together and, and sharing our thoughts and our grief. Uh, but, you know, no one's ever been luckier in terms of who their dad was. Hmm. Uh, he worked with you and your family on uh, really beginning to think about and give away so much of the wealth you created, um, which was because you were really good at business, among other things. Yeah. I have a very simple question for you, Mr. Gates. Uh, when we look at the four largest companies in America, we have Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, Amazon, and Apple. Why are they all tech companies? I'm biased. I think technology has done amazing things. Obviously, it's uh, you know we've got to uh, have rules of, about it. But wow, uh, the magic of software, the internet, uh, the ability to look at data, let scientists collaborate. You know, technology has has done some phenomenal things. And so, you know, my whole life I've been evangelizing that you know let's take advantage of it to improve education, to improve health. Uh, there's a lot more to be done, uh, but there's a lot of amazing work uh, those companies are responsible for. And up until my foundation work, that was my my whole uh, focus was that work. And, uh, you know, it, it continues. Yeah, you were celebrated for it. The company famously took heat for it. I'm curious, as you, we look out today, uh, the government definitely went at Microsoft for alleged anti-competitive behavior. We're not here to relitigate all that today, but there's a lot of informed people who look at the big tech companies today and think they're not getting it as hard as you did. Uh, do you think today's CEOs know how lucky they may be and, and will that change? Well, I think as, as you go forward, there are a lot of questions. Uh, you know, Microsoft wasn't in the... Um, social media business where issues about political things and conspiracies and you know how should you draw the line on what's on there. Uh, the tech companies are so important now, it's not surprising that the governments are looking at, you know, competition and interoperability. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so there are lessons or things that Microsoft learned as we interface with the government. I hope uh, the others go back and, you know, look at, uh, you know, how that all went. But it makes sense for government to care a lot about the central role of technology and making sure that they, uh, we get more of the good and, and less of the bad. That brings us to something that I really want to ask you about. 
I have a hunch you may not want to answer it much, um, but you're, you're so influential in these areas, I'm going to try anyway. And that is the power of these social media companies um, to publish or delist and ban people is huge. And as you know, the original concern hundreds of years ago was that the government would disappear speech. There are a lot of people, especially young people, who are more concerned about where they are online than anything the federal government might do. Are you at all concerned when tech companies can make basically unchecked decisions to take people off their platforms, that they might get the call right a lot, but then not? Uh, any, any advice or thoughts on that? There's clearly trade-offs involved where, you know, false information, you know, that, uh, you know, causes riots or uh, people not to trust uh, medicines or rewrites, you know, history like Holocaust denial. Uh, how you draw the line and who's in a position to do that uh, is a great thing for people to be debating. Uh, I haven't seen a great solution where you draw the line in a way that everybody feels comfortable with who's doing the interpretation and how it works. You know, there's been a lot of uh, bad stuff on social media, and, you know, I'm glad at least some of that uh, is being held back. As you say, you might go too far, but, uh, you know, my tech career uh, is largely over. Now, you know, I'm a champion for, for health. Uh, and this next generation's got to solve this problem. Yeah, understood. Uh, you've always been your own boss, um, but you also have a little bit of a style that, that is sometimes called being boss. Uh, the difference being, as you know, not whether you're technically the boss, um, but whether you have that confidence. And we were looking through the archives and we found a great example of this, uh, a young uh, Mr. Gates uh, explaining his outlook. Take a look. Can you see yourself working for somebody else? I never have. Can you see it? Well, in the in the sense that we work together, but uh, answering it, to a boss. I'm used to to having a company where um, the ideas that I have are, are something that I can easily pursue. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be a, a tough transition. How important was your confidence in addition to your innovation in your career? Well, certainly when I was young, uh, you know, I had uh, the brashness of youth to pursue ideas that seemed crazy at the time. You know, a computer on every desk in every home, the central role of software. And, you know, I, uh, you know, turned out that those beliefs really worked out very well. Uh, and that's why I have the wealth uh, that now goes to the foundation and, you know, is there to try and uh, provide healthy lives, even in the poorest countries. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, my interests, my personality, my timing all came together. Uh, so the Microsoft fortune, uh, you know, is now uh, being given away as, as best as Melinda and I can. Mm. Before we lose you, I got to ask you about your role in music and culture. Uh, I read that you and Melinda like Willie Nelson and The Sound of Music. Uh, but the genre where you are cited most is hip hop. Over 125 songs cite you, uh, Mr. Gates, uh, including Lil Wayne's Bill Gates and Rick Ross's Bill Gates. Uh, and the common theme here is a lot of rappers from humble roots say they're inspired by both your work ethic and your success. I, I want to ask you about just three of them where you could tell us whether, yes, they, they got it accurate or maybe no, they're a little off. Uh, and the first is from Andre 3000. And he says what he likes about you is that you do not show off your wealth. He says, Bill Gates don't dangle diamonds in your face when he Microsoft in the place. Accurate or no? Well, I, I you know, lyrics aren't, you know, the ultimate uh, full description of people I, I kind of doubt. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, I sometimes, you know, fly in a plane. I, you know, I have, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to have enough money, uh, to, for things like kids education, you know, so, you know, I hope I'm taking some responsibility for the, the lucky position I am in by giving my time, mm. uh, to the foundation. But Andre seems to like that he doesn't think you're showy. Well, I'll try. I'll try to 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 
uh, live up to that. <laughs> I, you know, I don't try to be showy. Here's one about uh, tax policy. This is from uh, young New York rapper Joey Badass. He says, just had to pay like 60 stacks in taxes. Why they take a piece of my assets? Does Bill Gates have these same fees? Please, I need the answers. Uh, is it accurate? Do some wealthy people avoid their, their fair share? Uh you know, I paid over $10 billion in taxes, and I think you could have a progressive tax system where uh, people in my position would have paid more. You know, obviously, you can go to an extreme where you uh, hurt uh, the incentives, but, you know, the U.S. is far short of that. And on my uh, Gates notes, you can see some thoughts about uh, U.S. making U.S. taxes more progressive, you know, but I'm just one voter in that in that question. <laughs> Um, and then finally, I'd love to do a lightning round where I, I say a word to you and you give us your thoughts in you know, a sentence or a word and people can see you're concise, so I don't think this will be hard for you. Uh, in, in a word or a sentence, 2020. Uh, recovery. 2021. Normalcy. Your microwave dinners that we've heard about. Uh, very dry. <laughs> And uh, what your next TED Talk might be about? Uh, well, I, my 2010 TED Talk was about climate change. So uh, climate change and pandemics are where I'm uh, trying to help the world get good plans so uh, we don't suffer the, the huge consequences. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Thanks to Bill Gates for being our debut guest on the Beat Summit series with Ari Melber. Yeah, great to talk to you.